the word. On Thursday nights, we're going through 2 Samuel, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Tonight is chapter 5. We completed chapter 4 last week, and um, it was quite an interesting chapter, to say the least. It was probably one of the more bloodier and violent chapters in God's word, but uh, it was also a chapter where we uh, turn a corner of sorts in David's life, and this is a huge defining moment for David. Uh, David has heretofore continued to simply wait on the Lord and the Lord's timing, and now we're going to see he's going to finally, after all these years, take his rightful place as king of all Israel. And here's the thing, and make no mistake about this, David was handed numerous opportunities over the years in which he could have, by his own hand, seized the throne. In his own time, by his own doing, he could have easily, in, on no less than two occasions, have taken Saul's life, but he didn't. And he just chose instead to wait for the Lord to bring it about in his way, in his time, and for his glory. Charles Spurgeon expounds on this and says, David waited seven years and more before he came to the throne of Israel. He reigned, meanwhile, with great wisdom and justice, over that portion of the land which owned his sway, I love that, and by his conduct commended himself to general esteem. It was far better to be preparing for the crown. Listen to this. It was far better to be preparing for the crown than to be plotting to obtain it. He was preparing for it and he was allowing God to prepare him for it. He did not seize it in his own way and by his own hand. And that's why we're going to see here, beginning in verse 1, that all of the tribes of Israel now who have been watching him over the years, they've been watching how he spared Saul's life. They've been watching him mourn at the news of Saul's death and Jonathan's death and even more recently, Abner's death, and they're realizing this David is the real deal. I, I suppose you could say, in a way, he has proven himself, and now all of the tribes of Israel are going to come to him. He doesn't go to them. Hey, I'm, I'm your king now. God ordained me to be king. No, they come to him. David, you're our king. See, up to this point, only the tribe of Judah had anointed him king, and this while he dwelt only in Hebron. And during this time, he's just waiting patiently for God's timing. He's not pushing himself. He's not promoting himself. He's just allowing himself in God's timing to be placed in that position to which he knows he's called. There's a priceless life lesson that I want us to see here before we jump into verse 1. And it's this, God's perfect timing will always, always grant us that which our striving for will only mar and devalue. Think about that. Had David strived for this, not waited for this, he would have marred this. He would have cheapened this, if you will. Oswald Chambers, in his famous, really, devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, it's actually January 4th, and I know I've quoted it and shared it on many occasions, and the reason is because it has been such a powerful uh, lesson for me in my life. He talks about waiting for the Lord, not getting ahead of the Lord, not rushing in to fill in the blank space, because when you do, you'll always make problems for yourself that will take years to make right. Can you imagine had David rushed ahead of the Lord on this and seized the throne 
before it was God's perfect timing, He would have caused for Himself problems that maybe even years would have never set right. It is always the Lord who will grant us in His perfect timing that which our striving for will only mar and devalue and even cheapen. Let's pray and then we'll jump into verse 1. Lord, thank You. Thank You so much for Your Word, for this chapter that's opened up before us tonight. Lord, would You now settle our minds and focus our attention and our hearts upon You and Your Word and that which You have for each and every one of us tonight and not necessarily the same thing for each and every one of us. Lord, You're going to speak in a myriad of ways in and through this, this chapter. And so, Lord, that's what we want You to do by the Holy Spirit. Just speak very clearly in that still and small voice that we might hear and heed. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also, verse 2, in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Therefore, verse 3, all the elders of Israel came to the king of Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them. Notice, they didn't make a covenant with David. David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. The reason I mentioned that it was David who made the covenant is because it's akin to God making a covenant with Abraham. Abraham did not make a covenant with God. God has made a covenant with us. It's not our covenant with Him. We cannot keep that covenant. Only He can keep that covenant. And that's why this detail, I believe, is there. Well, a couple thoughts here right at the start. The first of which has to do with all of the tribes of Israel now finally <laughs> acknowledging David as their king. And by their own admission... You, David, are the one who was anointed to shepherd the people of God. <laughs> well, finally you acknowledge that. In other words, you've known that all along. Here's what I'm thinking. They accept David as their king only after Abner's puppet king, Ishbosheth, had been murdered. In other words, they're sort of out of options. Uh, they're out of kings, too. And so now they kind of are in the market for a king, if I can say it that way. And so I suppose you might say David has become a last resort for them, such that there wasn't anyone else. He was the rightful heir apparent, if you will. Here's where I'm headed with this. This is us, isn't it? <laughs> in many ways... We're just like the tribes of Israel. When it comes to accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior and our King, isn't it usually when we come to the end of ourselves? We're out of options. We've exhausted all of our resources. Our puppet king, Ishbosheth, is no more. Isn't it usually then when we finally accept Christ. On balance, it's not a bad thing necessarily in the sense that at least it's better late than never, as the saying goes, and especially, I think, more so when it comes to salvation. But think about this, and th this is really the question. Uh, why is it that we look to or call upon the Lord when it's a last resort instead of being our first response. They knew that David was anointed to be king. They knew that Ishbosheth was a puppet king. 
put in office by Abner. And here's the other thing. Um, I know this is kind of hypothetical, but could you imagine if David would have said, you know, no. <laughs> All the tribes come to him in Hebron, say, okay, David, you're our king. Uh, no, too late. No, we accept you and acknowledge you as our king. No, you had your chance. You rejected me. You accepted Ishbosheth. Not, not your king. <laughs> How's that working out for you now? <laughs> what are you saying? Well, aren't you glad that our greater than David accepts us? You know, we, we always talk about, well, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. The angels in heaven rejoice. But think about this. You know what the greater miracle is? Not that you accepted him, but that he accepted you. You know, it, it's kind of interesting because, you know, it's when famous people come to Christ, like, wow! You know, and, and we always think about the influential people. Oh, man, wouldn't it be great if they came to Christ? Really? Think about what you're saying. It's kind of, well, like God could really use them in the kingdom of God because they're so powerful and influential. I mean, what, what an asset they would be to Christianity, if they would just but get saved. <laughs> and, and we always have these, you know, testimonies. And then I think to myself, man, when I came to Christ, I was a drug dealer, I was a drug addict, I was an alcoholic, I was addicted to tobacco, my lifestyle was the worst of the worst of the worst. I was on the verge of being homeless after being evicted from the third place in nine months for partying. And then here I, I come to Christ. I'm at the rock bottom, the end of myself. And I accept Christ. Hallelujah. But He accepted me. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, you know, all the angels in heaven. And, and I always question that too, because if, if I'm God, or at least if I'm the angels given charge concerning me, I would say, you know, Lord, not, not so fast on this one. This is not such a good deal, really. All right? <laughs> I mean, look at what you're getting. I mean, I gave my life to the Lord. Really? What did you actually give to Him? You, 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 what you gave to Him was all of your addictions, all of your problems, all of your sin, and the list goes on and on and on, and He accepted it, even though I had many times prior rejected Him. I rejected him and I chose my Ishbosheth instead, instead of him. And then, then finally, when I do acknowledge him and I do accept him like all of the tribes of Israel finally do, he accepts them. And that's the good news. That's the good news. Here's a second thought it has to do with what I'll call the three pronged reason as to why all the tribes finally accept David as king of all Israel. Here's the first one. He was one of them. He was flesh and blood. He was a fellow Israelite. Here's the second one. He had already demonstrated that he was a good leader, that he had a heart after God's own heart, and he was a good leader of Israel even while he was under Saul. Again, he had already proven himself. It's this third one that to me will ultimately seal the deal and it's that it was the Lord who had called him. It was the Lord who had anointed him to be king and ruler over all the people. And by the way this is a great template for leaders. You have to be one of them. You're not above them you're really, in the New Testament sense of the word, under rowers, serving them as one of them. And secondly, I think that a leader has to prove himself. He has to prove that and demonstrate that he is a good leader. And then thirdly, and without this one, uh, you have to be called. You have to be called. And unless God has called you and anointed you, uh, don't even think about it. <laughs> you will enter into a season in your life that will be riddled 
with all sorts of difficulties going up against the call of God in your life. First Chronicles 12 records more detail concerning this account where we're told that there were more than 340,000 men who came to Hebron. Think about that. That's if Kaniohe is 40,000, Kailua maybe another 40 or 50,000, that's 100,000 there. Uh, that's, that's the windward side times three. That's basically more than a third of the population of the island of Oahu. That's a lot of men that come to Hebron. Let me read 1 Chronicles 12, verses 38 through 40. It says, All these men of war, all 340,000 of them, who could keep ranks, came to Hebron with a loyal heart to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest of Israel were of one mind to make David king. And verse 39, they were there with David three days, eating and drinking, for their brethren had prepared for them. Moreover, those who were near to them, from as far away as Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali, were bringing food on donkeys and camels, on mules and oxen, provisions of flour and cakes, of figs and cakes of raisins, wine and oil and oxen and sheep, abundantly, the list goes on and on. And listen to this, for there was joy in Israel. This is a good day for Israel. They have a king. They have God's anointed king now, whom they have embraced and accepted. And make no mistake about it, they know who David is. Who hasn't heard of David? Who hasn't heard of that most downloaded song on iTunes? that Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. This is, this is the David that slew Goliath when Saul, our first king, was paralyzed in fear. This is the David with whom and to whom God delivered a bear and a lion into his hands. This is our king. Don't mess with Israel. Don't mess with Israel. This is a good day. They're rejoicing. They're celebrating. Verse 4, this is interesting. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, verse 5, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned, interesting, 33 years over all Israel and Judah. Did you catch that? Did you catch the typology in that? He was 30 years old when he began his reign. Jesus, our greater than David, referred to as the son of David, from the tribe of the lion of the tribe of Judah, he began his public ministry at age 30. And how about this? He reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. Jesus, our greater than David, went to the cross, paid the penalty for man's sin, and was resurrected from the grave at 33 years of age. David, I'm sure you know, is a type of Christ. Well, be that as it may, we've got some math to do here. David would end up spending a minimum of 15 years being prepared by the Lord for that which God was preparing for him. Fifteen years. Think about that. That's a long time. Fifteen years? Now, when you put it into perspective, fifteen years of preparation for forty years of reigning? Well, I can, I can get there. I can see that. Here's the point. The point is, God's seasons of preparation are always perfect when it comes to the season of doing that which God had been preparing you for. I think about Joseph. I think it was more than 15 years for Joseph. I think it was at least 17 years for Joseph. God was preparing him. You don't make a man the most powerful man in all of the world save Pharaoh without preparing him first. 
He has to go to the pit before he can go to the pinnacle. He has to be sold by his brothers whom he loved, left for dead, before he can be put in that position. He has to be betrayed. He has to be falsely accused. He has to go through all of these things as the preparation for that which God was preparing him for. Again, Charles Spurgeon, I think, says it best. He says, Without David's having made a single violent grasp at the crown, and he could have, it came to him by general consent. When providence has ripened a blessing for us, it will drop into our lap. But we must not put forth an unholy hand to seize it before the time. We cheapen it. We devalue it. We mar it. And in this day and age, is this not the order of the day? We want what we want, when we want it, in the color we want it, and we want it now. We don't want to wait. We devalue waiting. That's why we have microwaves. I don't want to wait. We, my, <laughs> my wife and I were doing some work around the house last night, we, and we got hungry, and we didn't want to wait to have to chop salad and, you know, make something. So what do we do? We go to the freezer. The freezer is of God because in that freezer, <laughs> there's fast food that you just stick in the microwave. And, oh, it's interesting because this lasagna that we had last night, which, by the way, was <laughs> delicious. We had an option. 45 minutes in the oven at 450 or 20 minutes in the microwave. What do you think we did? <laughs> we did the oven, of course. What? No, we did the microwave. We wanted it now. We wanted it fast. We didn't want to wait. Well, you know, sometimes we thwart what God has for us if we're willing to wait. It's kind of like you can take this much now less or you can if you're willing to wait you can have this later they've done some interesting studies i don't want to get into the whole psychoanalysis of it neurologically the way our brains are wired sometimes we'll opt for something that we can have now and they do this with kids it's really cruel i think no wonder i'm scarred and traumatized for the rest of my life they'll say to the kid you can have uh uh, M&M's, yeah, you, you guys know this study, right? You can have uh, this many M&M's now, but if you're willing to wait, you can have this many M&M's. And so they put them in front, and, and you're thinking, I want that many, but I don't want to wait for that many, so I'll just take less M&M's now instead of waiting for the more M&M's later. And we do that. Verse 6 and the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, <laughs> but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, and we're told parenthetically that is the city of David. Now, verse 8, David said on that day, Whoever climbs up by the way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame, and the blind who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore, they say, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built all around from the Milo and inward. So, verse 10, David went on and became great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. Okay, what's going on here? This is very interesting. Uh, up to this time, the Jebusites still had possession of Jerusalem. However, the time had come, now it was for Israel to possess Jerusalem, which in part would ultimately come to be known as the city of David. Now, I know I I um, run the risk of making a shameless plug for our Israel tour. <laughs> but when we're there in May, we're going to see this very area that today is called the City of David. And uh, I might be getting ahead of myself, but um, this, uh, 
way that he was able to seize the city, we're also going to see how he did it. It's very fascinating. Anyway, there's something here that I think we do well to take note of before we uh, talk about that. And it has to do with the security of the city of Jerusalem. You have to understand that Jerusalem was a very easy city to defend by virtue of its location and its elevation. Now I point that out because in the metaphorical sense, so too is this true for us in the sense that we are never more secure than when we're in the right place with the Lord location and our mind is stayed on Him. Heavenly things. We are never more secure than when we're heavenly minded. We're never more secure than when we lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thief cannot break in and steal. Where we're at with the Lord, our treasures with the Lord, location, elevation, that's our security. That's our security. Jerusalem, by the way, means possession of peace. Yaru, Salem, Shalom, peace in Arabic, Salem, Salam Aleikum, peace be unto you. Possession of peace. <laughs> the one city on the entire planet that is <laughs> the, the focus of the entire world, which is prophecy, but and the one place where there's the most turmoil and the most threat of war is named possession of peace. It will be the eternal Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, when the Prince of Peace finally rules and reigns and us with him, that's when it will truly be the city possession of peace. But what's interesting is we're told that David captured the city by way of this water shaft, the text tells us. Is somebody like doing construction uh, right now uh, next door? <laughs> Lord, I just pray that won't be a distraction that we'll be able to focus on your word. Um, let the motor burn out on it or something. I don't know. Let the electricity go out. I know that's bad, but just, Lord, do something. We just, it's distracting me. So I thank you in Jesus' name. Anyway. Okay, no, <laughs> no. So, I hope the motor didn't burn out, but anyway. <laughs> what is this waterway? Jerusalem is so secure, you cannot capture the city. How did they do it? Well, apparently there's this water tunnel. It's known as Hezekiah's Tunnel. And by the way, very interesting, again, for those of you who went to Israel with us, those of you who are going to go to Israel with us, we're going to see this tunnel. It is so cool. We're going to go in. If you're claustrophobic, wait in the bus, and uh, we'll meet you on the other side. But we're going to see this very tunnel that David used to seize Jerusalem, the eternal capital of God and of Israel. One more thing I want to point out before we uh, move on. It has to do with this uh, detail that's recorded in verse 6. In fact, it's repeated three times. The lame and blind cannot come. The lame and blind. The la what is up with the uh, lame and, and blind? Well, it's thought that uh, David is responding to them saying that their gods will prevail over the true and living God of Israel. And so David's response to them is your gods are no gods at all. Your gods are lame. <laughs> He's calling their gods lame. And your gods are blind. Your gods are false. And your lame and blind gods will not keep us from capturing Jerusalem. And it's really kind of interesting because it seems they're a little overconfident. You can't get in here. And David's response is, well, your lame and blind gods aren't going to keep us from getting in there because our God is going to get us in there. Verse 11, Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. How cool is this? 
So David, verse 12, knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people. There's a lot packed into verses 11 and 12, and I want to try to sort through it. Uh, It seems that God by the Holy Spirit, deemed it necessary to include this detail of Hiram, who is the king of Tyre, blessing David by building him what appears to be a very nice house, free of charge, as a gift. (laughs) What? Why is he doing that? Well... And why do we need to know this? And why is this... I mean, it's almost like the the narrative just kind of takes this abrupt turn... We just got done capturing Jerusalem by way of this tunnel. And then all of a sudden, we're introduced to this king of Tyre, Hiram. And it seems kind of almost out of place. Why do we need to know this? Well, I think that we have the answer in verse 12, at least for now anyway. There's another reason for this. But to me, it is because it was a confirmation for David. David needed a confirmation? I think so. I think David needed to have this confirmed. He needed to know that God had established him as king over Israel and for the sake of Israel. This is very important. Please don't miss this. Uh, In fact, there's another three-pronged template, if you don't mind, that's here. More specifically, the first part of this three-pronged template is that David would know that he was called. This was the time, and it was him, and it was now. Here's the second one, and this is important. At first read, it might might not seem so. David needed confirmation that he belonged to God. Why would he need that specifically? Of course he belongs to God. He's got a heart after God, right? Well, think about this. Uh, he supposedly feigned that he belonged to the Philistines for a year and four months. So this was a confirmation that he belonged to God. It's this third one that I think, again, is the most important of all. David knew, and he needed this confirmed, that God was choosing him and using him as a conduit to bless the people of God. In other words, this wasn't for David. This was for God's people. This wasn't for David's sake. He was merely the instrument, the conduit. And it was for the sake of God's people, to bless God's people. Listen, as a pastor, this makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Do I need to pray again? (laughs) Oh, Lord. (laughs) It makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. What little is left back there anyway? Because... God forbid I ever forget that Him choosing and using me is not about me, it's not for me, it's for His people. I am only the conduit, I am only the instrument in His hand, and may I never forget it. Verse 13, and David ah, took more concubines, really? And wives from Jerusalem. Dude, don't you have enough wives? After he came from Hebron, also more sons and daughters were born to David. And now, verse 14, we're given the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama. If you're looking for baby names, I don't recommend any of these except for maybe Solomon and Nathan. Eliada <laughs> and Eli Felet. Wow. David. No. Oh, how I wish these verses were not in our Bibles. They are. And for important reasons. Not so easily seen, maybe again at first read, but I would suggest that one of the reasons we have this included is because God delaying doesn't mean God dismissing and I'll explain what I mean by that though the consequences of sin and this is sin 
God's word explicitly forbid kings from multiplying wives, horses for that matter as well. David is sinning and disobeying God. And one would think that he just got a new house built. God's blessing him. He just got anointed king of all Israel. He just captured Jerusalem. We're about to read before we end the chapter. He's going to capture the, and, and defeat the Philistines. It's like God's still blessing him, but yet he's sinning. What is up with that? Though the consequences of my sin may be delayed, don't ever think that God has turned a blind eye to them as if they've been dismissed. It's not like God saying, yeah, but he's my anointed king and look at all the good he's doing. He's got a heart after my heart. I mean, he's, he's obedient to me. He's always inquiring of me. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to overlook this. Don't think for a second that's the case here. Just because God doesn't discipline David on the spot, immediately, doesn't mean that he's not going to. Sin is his own reward. I can't even begin to tell you, and those of you who know God's word as it relates to David's life, this destroyed him. And it certainly destroyed Solomon, his son, after him. The many wives drew them away from the Lord. He will pay an unbelievable, incalculable cost for his disobedience. And just because it's not manifested at the time, just because you think you're getting away with it for a while, God is not mocked. David will suffer unspeakable consequences for this sin. Don't think for a second that God is dismissing it just because that, those consequences are delayed. Now verse 17, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. The Philistines, verse 18, also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim, so, verse 19, David inquired of the Lord, <laughs> thank God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will, look at this word, doubtless. <laughs> doubtless? That means without a doubt. Oh, I wish God would answer my prayers with that word. Lord, will you? Doubtless I will. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I mean, you don't need a lot of faith when you've got doubtless. You're not walking by faith when you've got doubtless. You're walking by sight. Doubtless. Doubtless. Doubtless I will deliver. Doubtless. I love that word. Can we just stay with that word for just a moment? I just want to bask in the certainty of doubtless. I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. This is one of those places where God makes it what I call Red Sea clear. It's doubtless. Red Sea. The Egyptians uh, stopped by a pillar of fire and the Red Sea parted before me and dry ground inviting me. Lord, what's your will? <laughs> Lord, should I walk on dry land with the, the Red Sea parted and the Egyptians halted to which I just can hear from the heavens, you think? <laughs> Doubtless, this is the way the Lord would have you to go. That's Red Sea clear. And David has a Red Sea clear, doubtless, from the Lord. I love it. Notice that this specificity from God comes because of the specificity in David's prayers to God. And I point that out for two reasons. First, the more specific our prayers are to the Lord, the more specific specific the answers are 
from the Lord. Don't pray generic prayers. Don't, 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 don't pray. Pray prayers that invite answers like doubtless. <laughs> pray, pray doubtless prayers. Don't, don't pray the, you know, these wishy-washy, you know, prayers. Here's the second reason. I don't know if you notice this. But it said that when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king of all Israel, they set out to attack him. Isn't that textbook? Isn't that just par for the course, if I can say it that way? When the enemy hears of some great victory in our life, some great blessing in our life, oh, he's right there. He's going to serve up a thousand temptations on a silver platter. Our great, the thing I'm learning in my walk with the Lord is that our greatest spiritual attack and warfare will come on the heels of our greatest spiritual experiences. I know I've shared this before, but many years ago when I was pastoring on the mainland, I took a uh, team to Russia, and I taught at the Bible college there, and we were doing outreach at night. Uh, and we would have, you know, they would play music, and I would get up, and we had a translator, and I would uh, share the gospel and give an invitation. We watched on this one particular night these Russians coming to Christ by the multitudes, and it was, there are no words to describe it. Well, the next morning when I was doing the devotional, I said to these uh, college students, uh, there in the Bible College in Moscow, I said, you know what? Satan couldn't be happier with what happened last night. And they thought, what? You mean God couldn't be happy? No, no, no. Satan couldn't be happier with what happened last night. You want to know why? Because we experienced this great victory. We experienced God moving. Now watch out because he is going to attack you. And I'll, tell you, I'll give you an example of how he's going to attack you. He probably already has. These musicians were really good. Oh my goodness, they were so good. And these are Russian kids that have come to Christ. They're on fire for the Lord. And God's given them this musical gift. And I mean, it was really good. And I, and I said, right now, Satan's coming to you going, man, all, all of those salvations, you're pretty good. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, that one song, when you did that one song, oh, oh, did you see them checking you out? Yeah. And then you're going to get heady. And then you're going to think it was you. And when you do that, it's just a matter of time. Our greatest spiritual attack will come on the heels of our greatest spiritual victories. When the enemy notices, like the Philistines, that God has anointed us and blessed us and granted us the victory, they set out to attack. That's how it works. <laughs> I'm going to take a step further just real quickly and suggest that not only are specific petitions directly proportionate to specific answer, but so too is this true for trials. And I'll, I'll explain how I get there. The more specific the prayer for victory, the more specific the answer of victory. And thus, the greater the victory, the greater the trial. Now here's the thing. <laughs> you know, I, I pray, I don't see God answer my prayers that specifically, and certainly I haven't heard God since I can remember, ever said doubtless. I mean, God's never really answered my prayer, Red Sea clear. I mean, did, does God still do that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Adam Clark kind of had a characteristic for him. He's usually very eloquent, but he's really blunt in his commentary. He asks, how is it that such supernatural directions and assistances are not communicated now? Because they are not asked for. 
And they are not asked for because they are not expected. And they are not expected because men have not faith. And they have not faith because they are under a refined spirit of atheism and have no spiritual intercourse with their Maker. Consider the source. Who's praying this specific prayer? Shall I go up against the Philistines? I mean, very specific. This is the same David who prayed concerning Goliath. This is the same David that prayed, that inquired of the Lord. How many times, replete through Scripture, do we read, David inquired of the Lord. David inquired of the Lord. He's about to do it again. So, verse 20, David went to Baal, Perazim, and David defeated them there, and he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. And, verse 21, they left their images there. You know what that is? That's their gods, their idols. And David and his men carried them away. Listen, if your God can be carried away, <laughs> I'm just it, how about if your God can be driven away? It's no God at all. <laughs> then the Philistines, verse 20, to went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Therefore, here it is, verse 23, David inquired of the Lord and he said, You shall not go up, not this time, circle around behind them and come up upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be, verse 24, when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly, for then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him, and he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. Did you get that? Very interesting. The chapter ends with what I believe is one of the most, if not the most powerful and profound lessons we as Christians could possibly learn. Hear me out. David, think about this, could have easily assumed that God would have him do the same thing he had just done. Should I, should I go up, he inquires of the Lord, and the Lord says, yes, but I'm not going to do it the same way this time. Yeah, but it worked last time. David could have rightfully assumed that God was going to do the same thing that he did. I mean, stay with what you know, right? Isn't that how the saying goes? Hey, if it's not broken, don't fix it. I mean, it, it worked last time, God. Why wouldn't it work this time? To David's credit, he doesn't make that assumption. And according to the narrative, it's a good thing he didn't because God had a very different plan. I love it. Again, Oswald Chambers says, sometimes we expect God to come in through a door. That's what he did last time. What if this time he wants to come in through a window? Listen, <laughs> God is not confined, restricted to the finiteness of our own limited understanding. And I, I wish it was that simple, don't you? I mean, it would sure make it a lot easier, wouldn't it? I mean, if God just did the same thing over and over again, this is how I got the victory last time, this is going to be how I get the victory this time. I don't even need to inquire of Him. Ooh, that's the problem. I'm of the belief that God will oftentimes do it a different way the next time, if for no other reason other than to keep us seeking Him depending on Him, inquiring of Him. Before we bring tonight's Bible study to an end, I want to take note of three takeaways, three things that I think we can take home with us tonight concerning verses 20 through 25. Here's the first one. One can never go wrong by inquiring of the Lord even when it might seem that doing so is unnecessary. And, and doing so under the banner that God already revealed and God already did it and this is what God did the last time and be very careful. Here's the second one. 
Never assume that just because God answered your prayer and gave you the victory the last time, that he's going to give you the victory the same way this time. God is God. God is infinite. And here's the third one, and again, perhaps the most important. There's no such thing as a formula in our Christian experience. In God's economy, A plus B doesn't always equal C. <laughs> it, it, our Christian experience is not insert tab A into slot B, and you'll be able to discern God's will, God's call, God's way. We do err greatly when we make these assumptions and employ these formulas because in so doing, we'll be prone to trust in the formula instead of trusting in the Lord. This is Psalm 20, verses 7 through 9. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God they have bowed down and fallen, those lame and blind gods that I'm going to carry away anyway. But we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord. May the king, listen, answer us when we call. Not if. Not if by chance I happen to on that rare occasion. Reminds me of that story I share it all the time. It's humorous. The wife says to the husband, we need to pray. To which the husband responds, is it that bad? <laughs> really? <laughs> we, we need to pray. No. He will answer us when we call. Does that mean that if we don't call, he won't answer? Yeah, you have not because you ask not. One of the most famous Proverbs, you know it well, we sing praise songs of it. Chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I want to include verse 7, and you'll see why here, I think, and then we'll close with this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. And here's verse 7, listen to this. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. What do you mean? Well, if I'm wise in my own eyes, that means I already know it all. And if I already know it all and I'm wise in my own eyes, then why am I going to bother acknowledging the Lord? I'm trusting in myself. I'm wise in my own eyes. I'm not trusting in the Lord. I'm not acknowledging the Lord. I understand. Here's the thing. This is the three-in-one principle. If I trust in the Lord with all my heart, if I lean on into my own understanding, if I acknowledge Him in all my ways, I do those three things, what will He do? One, lead my path. Or it actually, in the original language, carries with it the idea of He'll straighten your path out. He'll make your path straight. He'll straighten the mess out that you've apparently gotten yourself into. <laughs> and And... It, it, you've messed it up so bad that you have no other alternative but to throw up your hands and say, Oh God, <laughs> oh Lord, you have to trust Him. You made such a big mess of it. You have to acknowledge Him. You don't have any other choice. But when is it that we acknowledge Him in all of our ways? And when is it when we, that we trust Him with all of our heart? Is it not when we don't understand? Oh, Lord, I don't understand. I just picture God in heaven going, Oh, 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 I do, I do, I do. <laughs> Lord, this is impossible. And I just imagine God saying, I'm so glad it's impossible for you. Because as long as it's still possible for you, it's not possible for me. Because you won't bring it to me, because you're still trying to do it in the energy of your own flesh. He'll start, he's still trying to work it out and figure it out. I'll just wait here. And when, you, when you're finally at the place where you're just saying, ah, I give up. Well, it's about time. 
oh Lord, I just, I don't understand. I mean, please Lord. And, and all of a sudden you're crying out to Him, you're acknowledging Him, you're trusting in Him. And You know, we, we say, well, you know, God is the God of the impossible. And that's true. But I'm convinced that there's one thing that is impossible for God to do. And it's that which we deem still possible for us to do ourselves. And it's hands off to God. It's like we're saying, God, I, I, I got this. God said, okay. <laughs> I'll see you in a little bit. And so we, we strive and we, we're wise in our own eyes. We're trusting in our own heart. We're leaning on our own understanding. And as long as we're doing that, we're not acknowledging Him in any of our ways. We've got it figured out. We've got it worked out. We understand what we're doing here. The, the, the path is clear before us. And then, it's a matter of time. It's not if, it's when. You come to the end of yourself. And you realize, I, I can't. Remember that three-step program? I, I hate to call it that, but it's... Uh, kind of an offshoot of the famous 12-step program. It's very simple. It's really a three-step program. And, and by the way, this, this is really all throughout the Bible. You see it in the Old Testament with all of the men and women of God. It's, it's so simple. If you, if you peel back all the layers, it boils down to these three. Number one, I can't. That's step one. Realize I can't. Step two, no, he can. And this is the third step. Let him, let him. We say let go and let God, but you know we hold on so tightly. I mean, we, it's, it's like, you know, I, I, I want to do this because when I figure this out, I'm going to write a book. Yeah. Seven keys to working it out. I'm going I'm to I'm going to speak. I'm going to go on tour. I'm going to go on a speaking tour. I'm going to be and then in front of my name it'll be author speaker. <laughs> if you'll just do these seven steps, or I'll reveal to you these five keys. That's formula. <laughs> That's insert tab A into slot B. And, and mean no disrespect, I, 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 I love books. But there are too many books in the Christian bookstore that, that do this. That do this. Man, I don't have to acknowledge the Lord and all. I just need to buy this book for twenty nine ninety five and and uh, you know keep the the promises or you know take the steps or you know use the keys and unlock you know the thing ten this seven that five this and I wish it worked that way wouldn't that just make it a lot easier man I, we we wouldn't even have to pray no, we would just, it would already be right there. Just do this, then do that, and then it's like, it's like the in assembly instructions, and then, and then do this, and, and uh, yeah, I can figure this out. I can work this out. I'm going to roll up my arm sleeves and make this happen. And then, and then people come up to you, if for some reason you in some way were met with a measure of success, and they're going to say to you, whoa, how did you do it? And he said, well, I'll buy my, five, my books, the five keys of how I did it. You know what I love about what God has done in this amazing church that I have the unspeakable privilege to pastor? He has fashioned it in such a way that even if I wanted to, I couldn't take the credit. I love it whenever I'm out and about, and especially amongst other pastors, and they're going, whoa! I hear you guys are buying that property out, you know, in, you know, by uh, Kalu. How'd you guys do that? And, and I love it. And they're waiting for some, you know, brilliant, you know, strategic answer. Well, 
And instead, what they get is, <laughs> I don't know, we just showed up and God met us there and God did it. I love that. <laughs> I can, I love, it's really a Gideon thing and we're going to see the Gideon Springs. I had to get one more plug for our Israel trip. One of my favorite places is Gideon Springs. I love Gideon, man. I mean, even if he wanted to, the 301 walking back to the camp of the Israelites, even if they wanted to, they couldn't take the credit. Whoa, how'd you guys defeat 135,000 Midianites? Could you imagine? Oh, it was all in the wrist. It was all in the wrist. You should have seen us, man. Hey, buy our book, How We Defeated 135 <laughs> Am I beating this dead horse? I probably am. Why don't you all stand, we'll <laughs> pray. <laughs> oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you so much. Lord, thank you for the simple truths that are here in your word. We've seen many of them tonight, and we want to take them home with us, and we need for your Holy Spirit to begin that process of really applying them to our lives and blessing them to our hearts. Lord, may we be numbered amongst those of whom it can be said, they acknowledge the Lord in all of their ways. They trust in the Lord with all of their heart. And they're not leaning on their own understanding, the wisdom of their own eyes. And the Lord has just made their path straight and blessed them. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.